So it seems that you all rather liked my latest video on sigil magic and I just wanted to take a second right now to thank you all very much for having taken the time to watch that and for clicking the like button on that video so many times and also for all the kind comments you left over there. I also wanted to address a couple of the most common questions that came up in the comments section there before moving on to the second tutorial video and while we're here I thought I'd also give you one last little tip to keep the chances of success on your side which I'll share a little later in the video. I'd say that by far the most frequently asked question on that video was along the lines of what about talismans, what's the difference with a sigil, or should I burn the sigil of this angel that I've been talking to, which believe it or not is a variation of the same question. We need to dispel a misunderstanding here. That video was about a technique, not about a component of that technique, the chaos magic technique called sigil magic uses sigils, sure, but in no way, shape or form is it the only technique that uses sigils. Let me use an analogy here. Think of how we use writing. Sometimes we write using a pen and paper, sometimes we write using a keyboard, sometimes we write to send news to a loved one from the battlefield, sometimes we write a contract, sometimes we write our name at the bottom of a contract, sometimes we write our username and password to log into a website. Sometimes we write a few sentences from a book that we've enjoyed in order to share those beautiful words with a friend, and sometimes we write a chapter of a novel that we're creating. There are lots of different situations in which we might use writing, and some are similar to each other, and some are not. But it would never occur to us to apply a postage stamp on our computer screen after logging in just because we've used writing to log in. And we're used to putting stamps on postcards for which we also use writing. Well, sigils are the same. The method that I shared with you in that video has a name, and when occultists say that name, sigil magic, other occultists generally know what specific method you're talking about. It's just a shortcut, jargon if you will. In the same way, when you're listing your hobbies at the end of a CV, if you put in writing, the assumption is that you enjoy writing fictional or non-fictional books, not that you really enjoy filling in surveys, even if that also involves writing. So just because there's this technique called sigil magic, that doesn't mean that this is the only way sigils are used. There are many uses for sigils, magical and non-magical. The king or queen's seal is a sigil, more commonly known as a coat of arms, but a sigil nonetheless. Literally, a sigil is just a graphic symbol that represents something or someone, without actually necessarily looking like that something or someone. The sigil may be figurative, so recognisable as an actual thing, or it may be simply geometric, or it may be completely abstract. And here's the thing, with writing, you can write something that already exists, or something new. With sigils, it's the same thing. I gave you one method for creating your own new sigil in that latest video. There are many more methods, by the way, though the method that I gave you is the one most commonly used specifically for sigil magic. But there's a method that I already described some months ago that's used for creating planetary talismans, for example, or the method described by Damien Eccles in his excellent book High Magic, and so on. So, yes, lots of ways of creating a new sigil. But there are also sigils that already exist. These are usually sigils that belong to specific spirits. We don't use those in sigil magic, obviously. But we definitely use them in spirit evocation, for example. I'll talk about spirit evocation a little later in this tutorial series, but hopefully it's clear that while spirit magic and sigil magic are both magic, and they both use sigils, the actual thing you're doing, the process, is completely different. In one situation, you're sending a new program to your unconscious mind, and in the other, you're calling an entity. And just because you burn the sigil in one technique doesn't mean you'll burn the sigil in the other. The sigil isn't the magic. What you do to the sigil is the magic. So then another question that comes up a lot is that someone must have created those Solomonic sigils. So what was the process there? Well, the Solomonic sigils are examples of sigils that were already there, so to speak. Tradition has it that these sigils are not created by humans. 
but rather given to a practitioner who's been introduced to that spirit by, say, another spirit with which that practitioner has already established a working relationship. So let's say you've been performing the LBRP regularly, maybe several times a day for a few months, and you come to the point where this very specific need enters your life. Like your job suddenly requires you to become good at programming, fast. So you might ask the four archangels, who normally come without sigils, to put you in contact with an entity who can help you with that. And then maybe you'll notice that there's a name bouncing around in your head and you say that name out loud and you ask that entity to help you to get good at programming. And it works. So you might want to be able to call on this spirit at some time in the future without necessarily having to go through the entities who introduced them. And so you simply ask, what's your sigil? And then you may or may not be given that sigil. The Solomonic grimoires are full of sigils that were acquired in this way by, well, allegedly Solomon, but actually whoever the practitioner was who was first introduced to these entities. Obviously you're not going to burn those sigils because you're using them for an entirely different purpose and in an entirely different way. Alright, let's talk about sigils on talismans for a second. As I mentioned in my video on talismans, linked in the description down below, Many of the planetary sigils are created on the basis of magic squares. And some are ready-made sigils that are received in the manner that I just described. If you look into the grimoire called The Greater Key of Solomon, you'll see a plethora of sigils that aren't made with a specific method, but rather received from the entities themselves, and then placed or engraved on an object. Usually a small disc made of the metal associated with whatever planet whose influence you're trying to capture in the talisman. And you then carry that object with you. A talisman has a birth chart in the same way you do. And just like you are a continuing, ongoing embodiment of the astrological conditions of the exact time of your birth, the same applies to the talisman. According to astrologers, you carry your astrological birth conditions with you throughout your life. So a Taurus born in May remains a Taurus throughout the year, even in November, and attracts Taurian kinds of things into his or her life regardless of the current astrological conditions. Talismans do the same. They're born at a certain astrological time that is carefully chosen by the practitioner and is made of stuff that reinforces those conditions and has stuff drawn on them that also reinforce and confirm those conditions. The things you draw happen to be planetary sigils. Obviously, you wouldn't burn your talisman just because you drew a sigil on it and there happens to be this other technique called sigil magic where you're supposed to burn the sigil. Talisman magic isn't sigil magic, even if it uses sigils. Hopefully that little explanation goes some way towards helping some of you. Now, another question that I saw coming up a lot was about journaling. I've talked in the past about how important it is to keep a journal of your practices. How to approach this particular practice when step 5 of sigil magic is to not think about it. In truth, I don't have THE answer to this question, I can only tell you what I do. I don't log my sigil magic workings in my journal. It's the only kind of practice I consciously choose not to log. Is it the best way? I honestly couldn't say, as I haven't experimented with logging sigil magic, so I've really got nothing to compare it with. It feels natural to me that if part of sigil magic's technique is to forget it, then logging it just because that's what you're supposed to do with all workings seems to go against my principle that generalities are fine as long as you're okay with accommodating exceptions when they present themselves. So really, that's as helpful as I can be with this particular topic, I'm afraid. If you have experience with both options, I'd be very curious to know what your preference is. So please feel enthusiastically encouraged to pop a word into the comments down below. Okay, so finally, that little extra tip I promised you at the beginning of the video. I gave you five rules for writing your sentence, but there is in fact a sixth rule. If you've watched my short series on the power of language, you'll probably already know what this is. Keep your sentence in the positive form. Your unconscious mind doesn't recognize words that switch a sentence to a negative. Don't run with scissors in your hand immediately brings up an image of running with scissors in your hand. So something like, 
walk slowly when holding scissors is the correct way to build that sentence. You're no longer saying what not to do and instead you're saying what you should do. I don't smoke sounds identical to I smoke to your unconscious mind. Even I've stopped smoking doesn't work because stopping smoking is something that a smoker does at the end of every cigarette before they burn their fingers. You need to strive for whatever the positive, reverse version of that negative sentence is. So maybe something closer to, I breathe clean air whenever I can. So there we are, my extra little tip for your sigil magic. If there are still any questions you have on sigil magic, then please take a moment to pop them down in the comments below. I might not make a full video to answer them like this one, but I'll definitely answer as many as I can. And of course, don't forget that there's the Foolish Fish Discord chat server, which is open to all members of my channel, with memberships starting at just $2 a month. Just click on the little join button next to the subscribe button, or check out the link in the description to find out more. The instructions on how to join the Discord channel, once you remember, are also right here in the description. Do take a moment to hit the like button if you enjoyed the video, as you probably know that really helps these videos to get suggested to a wider audience which in turn makes it more sustainable for me to keep making these videos. And if you haven't done so already, don't forget to click the little bell button next to the subscribe button so that you get shown my videos on your YouTube homepage more regularly. As always, my deepest gratitude goes out to every one of you for taking the time to watch and especially to the amazing community of members who make this channel sustainable. I am, as always, infinitely grateful to each and every one of you. Thank you all for watching and see you again soon with another video.